Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I don't know how many times in your life you'll run into a reading from Zechariah chapter 11 as a part of a reading because it's a rather dark story, even if it is intriguing. It's frankly a bit challenging even for scholars to sort out all the details. Nevertheless, the serious and sobering tone is clear, even if some of the details are a bit fuzzy. And the story is about a shepherd sent from Yahweh. Only God's people rejected this shepherd. And the result of this rejection is judgment. The most obvious, but by far, but far from the only connection to the passion of our Lord is the specific mention of 30 pieces of silver. If you think about it, you probably could, you would probably agree, it's pretty rare that the Bible tells us the price of anything, right? So when it does, there's usually some significance. In fact, this is about the only place in Matthew that we see any price tag of anything. So there must be some significance. Well, First, it, how, we, we need to understand at least the basics of this story in Zechariah chapter 11. There is a shepherd and there is a flock that he cares for. Now, the shepherd could be Zechariah or Yahweh or perhaps someone else. However, we don't know the name of the shepherd for sure. The staff, the staffs do get names. There's different, you know, I looked at about I looked at Bible Hub where you can look at a bunch of translations and they had about 10 different translations uh, for what these staffs were. Uh, perhaps the best are delight and unity, although there's a variety of them. You can look up for yourself if you'd like. But the point of these staffs is to communicate something. And one is this shepherd was not just collecting a paycheck. He delighted in the flock or favored them if you prefer and he kept them together. Yet even though the shepherd had been nothing but good to the flock, the flock ends up despising him. Eventually the shepherd grows weary of their obstinacy, and since they're no longer listening to him anyway, he stops shepherding them. He breaks the staff called delight, symbolizing that he no longer delights in them. He goes to the overseers of the flock saying, pay me or don't, but either way, I'm out of here. I'm leaving. I can't take it anymore. But instead of paying him what he's due or a moderately respectful price, they pay him 30 pieces of silver. Turns out 30 pieces of silver is the price set in the Mosaic law and the Torah for a slave. It also is much less than what this guy the shepherd has earned. This would kind of be like leaving just a couple of quarters as a tip when you had a party of six and bought like $100 of food and had plenty of drink refills and left a pittance behind for the server. It's practically even more disrespectful than just leaving nothing in the first place or not tipping at all. The shepherd, in other words, is not, is not paid anything close to fair wages. They pay him as if he was a slave that they owned. It's not only insulting, it indicates how out of touch with reality these overseers are. Now, uh, instead of accepting this insult, the shepherd throws back what he sarcastically calls the lordly price to the house of the Lord and to the potter. In other words, I'll keep my self-respect, thank you very much, it, this doesn't even come close to my worth, so keep your stinking change. Yahweh says, this is exactly what it's been like taking care of my people. I delighted in them. I protected and preserved them from the Egyptians and the Philistines, among many others. I blessed them in the land and gave them judges and heroes to rule over them but they only grew more and more stubborn and wayward. Whenever I called them to account, they treated me worse than a regular king, worse than a mafia boss, worse than a blue-collar worker. They treated me, their lord, like a slave. 
I am the Lord, says Yahweh. I am not your slave. So in my disgust, I've thrown away your disrespectful and empty gestures of loyalty and reconciliation. I don't need a few pitiful silver coins or um, your empty words or insincere prayers. What I want is your fealty and your faith. Well, this account really reads a lot like one of Jesus' parables where God's people end up being the villains. The stubborn and treacherous flock of Israel is not appreciative or respectful, so they've got what they have coming. Yahweh says, you betrayed me, so there was punishment. So I've broken my staff unity, and you will be broken apart and exiled off in a Babylonian timeout. Now, as the story, the more details you kind of put together, it becomes clear that this parable is an insight into God's perspective on how it's been, what it's been like trying to shepherd his people. And if there's details that are confusing, the chances, odds are that they're probably about what's happened in Israel's past. Zechariah is telling a, a parable, I think is the best word I can think of, to talk about what it's been like. And he's describing a punishment that happened in the exile. Um, but there are so, there's so much overlap with the, the New Testament and the story of the Passion, which is certainly not coincidental. But what Zechariah wants the people to do is he wants them to understand the punishment that they've endured, and he wants them to learn from their mistakes, repent, and return to the Lord instead of continuing to be stubborn towards God's instructions and dismissive of his promises. Well, Jesus and the story of the Passion is really the same sort of story. And it's a story for us like Zach, the one Zechariah tells is a story that helps us understand what happened to Jesus and is there to help us to repent, to stop being dismissive of God's promises, to repent when we have not followed his instructions. Um, Jesus certainly endures very similar stubbornness and disrespect in his own ministry. The, throughout Matthew's gospel, Jesus is clearly the shepherd of Israel. After Jesus' birth, Herod and Jerusalem are shown a prophecy from Micah in which it says about this child who has been born, from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Jesus, we're told in Matthew's gospel, looks at the crowds and has compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In his parable or account of the sheep and the goats at the judgment, Jesus is a shepherd separating the sheep from the goats, just like a shepherd would. And Jesus says of himself, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Furthermore, Jesus directly compares himself to the very same shepherd of Zechariah when Jesus quotes later in Matthew's gospel, uh, another section of Zechariah that says, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. It's crystal clear to me anyways that Jesus wants to, is identifying himself as this shepherd uh, from Zechariah. Just like the Zechariah shepherd, Jesus has a difficult and thankless job. Jesus has gone, if you remember the gospel stories, without sleep, and without food, caring for people. But instead of thanks, what does he receive, particularly from the leaders, the overseers of the flock of Israel? He receives doubt, anger, and eventually abuse. The clearest connection is, again, those 30 pieces of silver. Although Jesus is innocent, he's sent from Yahweh the chief priests, buy and sell him like a piece of property, like a slave. It's ironic that the betrayer, the Judas, eventually acknowledges the price was not worth it, that he has set the bar far too low. Jesus, Judas admits that he has betrayed innocent blood, trying to return the money, and he literally throws it into the temple. But worse than Judas's reaction is the high priest's. 
They are obsessed with appearances and concerned about legalities, purity legalities, so they won't use the money in the temple. It's blood money. They don't want to touch it. But, you know, it's still good money, right? So unlike Judas, they are shameless and use it to buy a burial field for foreigners, for unwanted. Judas throws this money that was meant to be a payment for Jesus' life back into the temple, and it goes to buy the potter's field, just as the money in Zechariah is thrown to the temple and to the potter. We, too, have sometimes treated Jesus as a slave, whom we could buy or sell when we don't want to hear from him anymore. We sometimes bandy his words about like tools that we can use to say whatever we want or feel like. And yet we ignore his words when they are difficult or hard. We cherry pick the Bible verses we want to win our point with no regard, sometimes a real concern for what it is that God's word is actually trying to say to us. Or we simply close our eyes and ignore what we are uncomfortable hearing. If he threatens our purse, like then we act just like Judas when his purse is threatened and we seek to get him out of our life. If he threatens or comforts our established sinful ways, we hiss at the messenger, maybe even attacking those who dared to point out our errors. Yes, you and I, we too, have betrayed God. After all, we are his disciples. We are supposed to be on his side, following in him. And yet, we often betray him. We own Bibles, but how often do we open them? We extol the virtues of prayer, but we fail sometimes to make time to pray. We proclaim ourselves as Christians, but often wear arrogance instead of humility as a cloak. There will be judgment, and there will be exile, just as in Zechariah's story. But the shocking thing is that it will be Yahweh's shepherd who endures it. It's not God's people this time who are exiled and punished, but Jesus is exiled and separated from God as well as from the world upon the cross. You see, there's a reason for this. It didn't really work to punish the people, not fully. So now Yahweh has sent his shepherd, his son, to endure rejection and punishment for doing good. Think about what Yahweh has tried so far and it hasn't worked, even in Jesus' own ministry. Punishments, consequences, riddles, pleading with people, they, none of these things have worked. And so Jesus' willingness to suffer to be rejected and killed is God's final attempt to win back the hearts of his people when nothing else would win us back. The passion is the story of God in Christ turning our wickedness and rejection into an opportunity for healing and reconciliation. As we think of 30 pieces of silver but the price set for a slave reminds me of another slave sold by the people of Israel who gives us wonderful words. Joseph, if you remember, was sold by his brothers as a slave. But in the end, when his brothers, when his father has died and his brothers are assuming that Joseph is now not going to hold back now that his dad is dead, and he's really going to give it to them. Joseph gathers his brothers and says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And so our Savior says to us after we come to the cross, we have treated God like he was in the wrong. We have sold him out in our sin, but the Son of God took up our sins and bore our iniquities so that he might heal us. Because of Christ's passion, we are forgiven. And through the Holy Spirit, we can now walk in faith as we follow the rejected, crucified, but also resurrected and now glorified and ascended shepherd of all God's peoples. In Jesus' name, amen.